I call it my moment in the mirror. It was a time after 23 years old. Picture this. I, I'm in good shape. I have a hot girlfriend. I drive a Camaro SS with 450 horsepower performance exhaust. Tricked out, man. Fully loaded. I loved it. I have money in my bank account. I'm a fully licensed psychotherapist. I just quit both of my jobs and now it's like, I'm just going to hang out for the summer and enjoy my life. At that moment, yeah, sounds great, right? Sounds like you got the dream. And at that moment, I thought I had the dream because this is what everybody tells you is like, you know, you made it when? And I was like, oh, I made it. Why am I still miserable? And now it becomes this really interesting moment because in society nowadays, if you have any level of success, but you say something is wrong, like you're miserable or you're upset or you're unhappy or you're sad or whatever, people will say that you're ungrateful. You don't know how to appreciate what you have. You will get judged extremely harshly. And so I didn't want to tell anybody that I felt this way because I felt like that's what was going to happen. Rightfully so, because that's what happens all the time. So at that moment, I'm just fed up. I'm in my house. I'm like, I don't know what the hell is wrong with me. I have everything that society says will make me happy, and yet I'm miserable. So I'm in the bathroom, and I slam my hands on the counter, and then I, I'm just pissed. I'm like, why, why, why can't I figure this out? And I look up at myself, and I figured it out. I said, oh my God, I get it now. You're Vincent. And that was the first time in seven years that I said my real name. But why that was so powerful and so profound was because of the fact that in that moment, I had realized the reason I was so miserable is I wasn't willing to accept my life. I wasn't willing to accept who I was. And I wasn't even taking ownership. I kept saying, well, I'm miserable because this person bullies me or because my, my girl is X, Y, and Z or because of this or that and continuously just giving my personal power away. And when I finally said my own name, that was my willingness to take my personal power back. And so... After becoming Vincenzo, I went back to becoming Vincent. And in there, I discovered um, these, these things I call the OR methodology, which is now my thing that I try to teach to people, which is ownership, acceptance, accountability, and responsibility. Hello, I'm John Brink, and we are podcasting on the brink from downtown Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And for all those people watching us around the world, they say we know where Canada is and we think we know where British Columbia is on the West Coast, right? Right. And we are 500 miles or 800 kilometers for our friends around the world and Europe in particular, north of Vancouver and central British Columbia, north, south, east, west. We are in the middle, big province. Lots of nature, lots of trees, lots of other nature, black bears, grizzly bears, grizzly bears, caribou, deer, wolves, you name it, we have it all. So today we have a very, very interesting guest. His name is Vin and Vanti. He is from New York and he has an amazing background in a lot of topics that are coming more and more in the open and are all around the world in terms of applying to anxiety, panic attacks, and depression, and that traps people into a structure that is can be very challenging, to say the least. And I believe that Ven has been very knowledgeable about it, but also is very proactive in it. He's an entrepreneur, active podcaster, and coacher. Ben, welcome to the show. John, thanks so much. I'm super excited to be here. And I love I love the photo on your book, man. Can I just point that out real quick? I love that. <laughs> You're looking at this one? Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah, Living Young. I'm also an author. And uh, this is my fourth book, and I'm working on five and six. This is... Living young, dying old. I just turned 84 on Friday, and wow. that's a picture of me. And uh, I'm the oldest competitive bodybuilder in North America. I qualified for bodybuilding 
in Canada, in the province of British Columbia, provincially, qualified me for the Nationals, and then qualified me for the Arnolds in 2018, 2019. But then COVID came, and now again, I'm training, right after the show again, uh, you know, the uh, uh, getting ready for the 2025 Arnolds, and this is the way I look today. Man, that's phenomenal. I'm uh, I'm just a hobbyist bodybuilder, but we'll we'll take you, a photo together. You look good, Vin. <laughs> it's all about <laughs> staying fit and healthy, right? So, yeah. So, give us a bit of your background, Vin. Is that uh, especially the issue of and I've been there myself at different stages in my life, anxiety, panic attack, depression, in a way, and trying to find out who am I and where do I go from here and, and why am I different than others and all that stuff relating to that, which can be very challenging uh, to an individual. And, and a lot of times not easy topics to talk about, even less so in public as you and me are sitting here, but very, very important. And there is no better media, in my opinion, than podcasting because we're podcasting around the world and we know we will have tens of thousands, if not millions of people watching us and a lot of these issues are the same around the world. So mm. give us a bit of your background and bring us up to today. For sure. Well, well, it's a pretty long story, so we'll take pauses in between. <laughs> no problem. When, when I was younger, I was bullied very heavily. I was a little bit of a chubby kid. Um, you're probably familiar with this being a bodybuilder. Is I struggled uh, very badly with gynecomastia, especially in my puberty years. and. I think the number is somewhere around like out of three out of five guys, their gyno goes away. Mine never did. So it just got worse and worse. Explain to us what exactly is that? Sure. So for you listeners out there who may not be familiar, uh, gynecomastia is when there's a development of female breast tissue in men. And it's very, very normal. Most guys actually go through it in puberty. They say four out of five guys will get it as they're going through puberty. However, it's also very common that it leaves as your hormones start to balance out. For me, it never really went away. Like I actually had to have surgery to get this removed because I was uh, very unlucky. <laughs> How old were you then? The surgery didn't take place until I was about 22 or 23. So yeah. And wow. so what did they do? They removed the... So yeah, they, they had to they had to cut out like apparently what it was or this is what I was told from the from the surgeon is that there was like uh, these lymph nodes that were growing in there and the lymph nodes uh, had like this extra tissue that was around it. There was also heavier fatty deposits because of this enlarged node. So they cut that out. They you know, did like a um, actually they even did a little bit of uh, lipo in that area after they cut out the nodes. And so that, that wound up being a whole process. I had to wear like this compression shirt for six months. Like I, <laughs> my friend joked around with me. He's like, he's like, you had a boob job. I was like, damn right. <laughs> so how did you find out about that you had it? Uh, you know, it was, it was interesting. I, <clears throat> I've always had a genetically big chest, even now after after getting rid of that, I still have a relatively big chest and I hate training chests, so I barely do it. And I wound up figuring it out because one, you know, my chest was kind of rounded out. I was always super embarrassed to take off my shirt. I never, never wanted to be seen in public without a shirt. Um, it was painful. Like I would lean to go do, for instance, preacher curls. And when I would lean on the machine, my chest hurt. There were so many things where you could put a little bit of pressure and it's extremely sensitive and it would hurt. And then people wouldn't know when I had my shirt on that I had this issue. So they'd just be like, man, you got a big chest. And for some reason, they would want to slap, slap my chest and be like, dude, your chest is huge. And I'd be like, ah, yeah, thanks. And like, holding in the fact that that hurt like crazy. 
And so I started realizing there's something, there's something wrong here. I just didn't know what it was, right? And then you went to the doc, and the doc said you have, how did you call it again? Gynoclamastia. Gynoclamastia. Yeah, and gyno said, for sure. Yeah, gyno. And, and so he said, or she said, but we should do then, you likely have to see a specialist, I assume, who then would make a recommendation, and he would have said, she would have said, you do have an operation. Or will it be fixed? Can it go fixed? Or will it disappear? Or what? <clears throat> yeah, so I, uh, I actually, this isn't a surgery that was going to be covered by the insurance. Uh, they saw it as cosmetic and not necessary, so I couldn't get it covered by insurance. I had to go to a plastic surgeon, and uh, they were just like, hey, like you, you know, I told them for years I've been working out. I've been trying to get rid of it through diet and exercise. And I would probably even overwork my chest because I kept thinking maybe if I just keep toning my chest, toning my chest, it'll go away. It never did. The chest up here kept getting rounder, but the chest down here kept just staying as it was. And there was nothing that could be done. So ultimately the option was like, you want it gone? We could get rid of it for you. And that was where we opted for surgery. So you can't see mine too well. But I look well for 84, but the yes, interesting sir. part is that <clears throat> what I know about it and how come I know about it is because my chest or my tissue was removed from my uh, breast and I had that done probably when I was in my 30s or 40s. Mm. And I've never heard of how you call it, gimo or, you know, so what I had is pain in my breast, mm-hmm. went to the dock, and then what I was told, that makes sense, that then went to a specialist, and what I was told, saw pictures, is breast cancer also happens in males. I wasn't aware of that. I, I, I still, even to today, have not heard about what you called it. And so they recommend that then I saw a specialist here, actually, in our city, who then recommended to remove the breast. So they did. Mm. So the tissue is gone, the nipple is here, and those things, yeah. but the underlying tissue was removed. There was no cancer. And, but I, al- I, I always thought about it as, I thought it was hormonal more than anything of a stage in my life. And I think they should not have done that. It really troubled me actually afterwards, although you can't see it on me when I'm working out a training. Right. And, and that is the thing. It is hormonal, right? It's, it's from those elevated estrogen levels. Most guys in the bodybuilding community have it because most of the bodybuilders take some form of a T booster, whether it's, you know, a a hardcore steroid or it's a natural one, anything you're doing that elevates your test will elevate the estrogen. And then that's where gyno starts coming in. It's those elevated estrogen levels that start building you know, enhancing the size of the nodes and then increasing the fatty deposits in the breast tissue. And so that's where it usually starts coming about is is what I wind up learning. Yeah. So in my case, uh, I didn't start bodybuilding until I was after 60. So that that was not part of me. We'll talk about that a little bit too. But uh, where, where we have the, I found it interesting that you mentioned this because I've not heard that before other than I'm one of the few individuals that I know had his breast removed. And the reason mm. that we did at the time is there was a concern about potentially cancer. And I was shown mm. pictures of men having breast cancer. And they say, I'm not an expert, I'm not a doc, but what I was told is the breast is one area of where male and female are the same. Interesting. 
and I had not never heard that before. But anyway, so uh, yeah. maybe uh, more people that know about it saw about. Uh, anyway, I want to share that with you and with the tens of thousands and millions of people that are watching us. So that then being said, I interrupted you because I wanted an explanation of that. So and then obviously my story in there. And so can you continue now? Yeah. yeah. So so I I got bullied for many, many different reasons. That was just one of them. I was a bit of an awkward kid. I was a bit of a nerd. I was a bit of a shy guy. And I experienced bullying that you would see on TV. Like, yeah. you know, you watch those old school movies and the kid gets shoved in the trash can. You're like, that doesn't happen. That actually did. That would happen to me. I would literally get thrown in the trash can and shoved into it, and pushed into the lockers. I got thrown down the steps one time. And so there were all these different things that I wound up experiencing throughout my life. And this put me in a state of a victimhood, uh, victim mentality, if you will. And that's where I believe a lot of my anxiety, depression and panic came about because I had no way to really feel like I had any control over my world. I would go to school and I'd be anxious. I'd, I'd have panic attacks when I would be getting ready for school or I'd wake up in the morning not wanting to go to school. Um, and, and I didn't know what was going on because I was only a, a young teenage kid. And so life was very out of control for me. And this is how I lived for, I mean, uh, until I was in my 20s, actually. Like my whole life was pretty much living in the state of victimhood. And so then what? So at that, at that point, I had a little bit of an epiphany. <clears throat> in high school, it, it dawned on me that Vincent is a loser. Like, he's this chubby kid. He's not popular. He's got no friends. He gets bullied. He can't get a girlfriend. Why would you want to keep being Vincent? Horrible. Horrible idea. So my thought was, if I can reinvent myself when I go into college, maybe life would be better. So I actually, on all of my college transcripts, I wrote down Vincenzo as my name. Nobody ever questioned that, which is funny because that's not my name. And yet all of my college degrees say Vincenzo, which is even funnier. And so I did this. I did the name change. I started wearing different clothes, spiked my hair, grew a different uh, style, I guess you might call it. And it worked to the degree that it could. I started making friends. I started having girls interested in me. I started working out more religiously and whole, whole life just got better. But the big thing was that as life got better, things got worse internally Yeah. because I was aware of the lie I was living. I was aware of the fact that I'm actually not this cool guy. I actually don't know how to talk to women. I don't know what it is to have friends. I don't believe in myself. I have no confidence. And despite the fact that that's how I operated internally, externally, I was a personal trainer, so I had a good job. I was fit. I was a mental health worker at a hospital. I was uh, co-facilitating therapy groups alongside psychiatrists. I was in school full time. So I had these two jobs, full time school, always was able to get women, just couldn't keep them. And then I had tons of friends. Yeah. So, so you would have never guessed that I was having worse and worse anxiety feeling more and more depressed, always feeling rejected, always feeling not good enough, had all these codependency behaviors and all these problems that I was trying to navigate internally. And things continued to get worse as I continued to go further and further into my college degree, my college career. And by the time I was in my master's program, I was basically calling my therapist every time I needed to make a decision because I actually couldn't make a decision without his feedback because I came to realize I didn't trust myself so much that I literally could not make any decision without somebody giving me the okay and saying, this is what you should do. And that was horrible. So I went through all of that. And then at 23 is when I had a very life changing moment, but I'll pause before we go into that in case you have anything you want to touch on in there. No, I want to get to the life changing moment. Let's do it then. Okay. So I call it my moment in the mirror. It was a time after 23 years old, picture this. I, I'm in good shape. I have a hot girlfriend. I drive a Camaro SS with 450 horsepower performance exhaust. Tricked out, man, fully loaded. I loved it. I have money in my bank account. I'm a fully licensed psychotherapist. I just quit both of my jobs and now it's like, I'm just gonna hang out for the summer and enjoy my life. At that moment, yeah, sounds great, right? Sounds like you got the dream. And at that moment, I 
thought I had the dream because this is what everybody tells you is like, you know, you made it when, and I was like, oh, I made it. Why am I still miserable? And now it becomes this really interesting moment because in society nowadays, if you have any level of success, but you say something is wrong, like you're miserable or you're upset or you're unhappy or you're sad or whatever, people will say that you're ungrateful. You don't know how to appreciate what you have. You will get judged extremely harshly. And so I didn't want to tell anybody that I felt this way because I felt like that's what was going to happen. Rightfully so, because that's what happens all the time. So at that moment, I'm just fed up. I'm in my house. I'm like, I don't know what the hell is wrong with me. I have everything that society says will make me happy, and yet I'm miserable. So I'm in the bathroom, and I slam my hands on the counter, and then I, I'm just pissed. I'm like, why, why, why can't I figure this out? And I look up at myself. And I figured it out. I said, oh my God, I get it now. You're Vincent. And that was the first time in seven years that I said my real name. But why that was so powerful and so profound was because of the fact that in that moment, I had realized the reason I was so miserable is I wasn't willing to accept my life. I wasn't willing to accept who I was. And I wasn't even taking ownership. I kept saying, well, I'm miserable because this person bullies me. Or because my my girl is X, Y, and Z, or because of this or that, and continuously just giving my personal power away. And when I finally said my own name, that was my willingness to take my personal power back. And so after becoming Vincenzo, I went back to becoming Vincent. And in there, I discovered um, these, these things I call the OR methodology, which is now my thing that I try to teach to people, which is ownership, acceptance, accountability, and responsibility. The ownership is that everything in your life in this moment, this applies to me, to you, John, and to every listener out there, everything in your life right here, right now, in this moment is a result of the decisions you did or did not make. You must have ownership over that because if you don't, you will never move ahead because that will lead you to the A, the acceptance and the accountability part. Because if you can't own it, you can't accept it. You definitely can't be accountable for it. So now it, bodes the question of well, what is the responsibility part and that's your future that's being able to take control and saying that though my life is a certain way right now i have the responsibility to be able to change my life in any moment if i should so choose to get a new desired outcome and so the conversation that i had with myself was very real, real and raw where i sat there and i talked to myself in the mirror and i said you're a loser you're a loser. you're depressed anxious. Nobody admires you. You're not inspiring. You have panic attacks. People pity you. And after I went on and on to myself, I just asked the simple question, is this who you want to be? Is this what you'd like to be known as? And the answer was no. You're and then I asked this other question, which was, who do you want to be? Well, I want to be a leader. I want to be inspiring. I want to be happy. I want to be empathetic. I want to be, I want to be powerful. I want to be confident. And then the final question leads into the responsibility part, so as you saw, I, I did the ownership, the acceptance, the Your accountability, own. and now the responsibility is these questions, because life is really just a series of questions. Good questions give good outcomes, bad questions give terrible outcomes. Your the good questions to catapult me forward was, what would a leader do? How would they show up in life? What would they say? What would they think? What would they feel? How would they, how would they be around others? And as I got very clear on all of those things I said I wanted to be, I game planned on what that would look like and how I could go do that. So I always like to tell people that that moment at 23, it changed my life in one way. It didn't actually change my life, but it changed my life because for the first time I felt in control and it gave me the opportunity to go down the path to change my life. And I think that a lot of people in today's world struggle to even get to the starting line. And that's why they can't figure out how to transform themselves in the first place. So that was my moment in the mirror, and that was the day that I regained control over my life. You're how long ago is that, uh, Vincent? Well, I am 33 right now, so that was 10 years ago that I've been on this journey. And how do you feel? I love my life, John. I, <laughs> I think I'm richer than, than some millionaires and billionaires. Yeah. So similarities let me give you a little bit of my background i was born in yeah. 1940 in northeastern holland and that was at the early start of the second world war and uh 
My mom and dad, they fell in love in 1938. They got married. They very quickly had a son and then a daughter. And then my mother was pregnant with me. I was born November the 1st, 1940. Then Hitler decided... Oh, birthday just passed. Just passed, Friday. Happy birthday. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so then uh, Hitler decided to invade the rest of Europe. They did the eastern part, then the rest of Europe. And my dad was drafted into the Dutch army uh, in April of 1940. And then for five years, they would not know if he was dead or alive. The last time he was seen was in the bombing of Rotterdam. Thousands and thousands of people died. And then I was born in uh, November 1940. And the first thing that I remember uh, was when I was three and a half, four years old, and again, visualized eastern, northeastern Holland up to the border of Germany. And I remember thousands or hundreds of planes in the air, bombers, that were bombing the war infrastructure in the northwestern part of Germany, close to the North Sea, where the North Sea touches Germany. Uh, Prem and Wilhelmshaven, Hamburg, and the distance we would stand outside our house on a flat roof is my mom. And the reason that we did is she felt safer outside than inside. And in the distance, we see the cities burning, the skies being red. And then the next thing that I remember is 1944-45. It was the hunger year. They had cut off all the supply of food. And I remember three and a half, four years old, then four and a half, five years old. Every morning we would go, my brother, my sister, myself, with gunny sacks to the airport or the, the railroad yards, pick up anything edible and burnable. And we would do that every day. And the reason that we did as kids, because the Germans would kick us, but they wouldn't shoot us. And then we come back the following day. And then the winter, 1944, 1945 in Holland was the coldest winter on record. And we only had one little room heated in the house with one little stove because there was nothing else. And I still feel the heat and the cold. And I can still feel that today, the hunger, the heat and the cold. And then mm. the other part was anxiety from feeling that from my mom because you never knew what would happen. She was there with three little kids by then, and everybody around her had the same issues, the same problems. And as the Germans dragged people out of their houses to send them to uh, the, the German factories to work, or worse yet, the Jewish families in our uh, neighborhood and in our cities, they never came back, obviously. And so it was a tough, tough time. Mm. Then I remember the liberation. <coughs> I got a bit of a cold, so bear with me. So then I remember the liberation of North, Northern Holland by the Allied forces that came June of uh, 1944, landed in Normandy, pushed their way through France, Belgium, into Holland along the west side, and then pushed them through the north back into Germany. And we saw far too much that we should not have seen. And uh, we were liberated by the Canadian Army, April the 12th, 1945. And I always knew then, from the time I was only around five years old, that I would, if I grew up, I'd go to the land of my heroes, Canada. So that always mm. stayed with me. The other part about it was that academically I was not a success story. I failed grade three and I failed grade seven three times. And then they say, what are we going to do with this guy? And some people said, well, send him to the mentally challenged school. And my parents said, no, we're not going to do that. Let's teach him a trade. And my dad had worked in lumber. My grandfather was a master carpenter. And so I liked that. So I, 
at 13, started working in a furniture factory. And kids are, as you already know, can be very hard on each other. When all the kids that I grew up with that went to college and university, I became a laborer. I'm proud of that mm -hmm. today, but then I was kind of looked down at. And they looked at me as a, being dumb, stupid, doesn't have any brains, will never amount to anything, all of those things. Mm. But at the same time, I knew I was going to go to Canada. I wanted to go when I was 17. My parents wouldn't let me, and I was then drafted in to the Dutch Air Force for two years, and Special Forces nonetheless. And then worked again in the forest industry. And then when I was 23, I then decided to go to Canada to prove to me that I was just as smart as the other guys and girls and <clears throat> that I could prove it to me only. So I wanted to start with nothing. Couldn't speak the language, didn't know soul, didn't have a job. But I knew I was going to go to Canada. I was going to go to the west coast of Canada where the timber is. And I was going to build a sawmill there. So I landed in July of 1965 in Montreal, took the train across Canada, four days, five nights. Oh my God, that's a long way. Landed in Vancouver, went to the immigration office, could speak the language, didn't know so, didn't have a job. There was fortunately a German fellow. I could speak some German. Told them what I wanted to do. He said, Prince George, go to Prince George. That's where all the sawmills are. That's where the future is. Felt mills, sawmills, plywood plants. That's where you should go. So I took the bus, the Greyhound bus, to Prince George, 14 hours. I could still see this where the station used to be here. And I came off the bus. I had the suitcase, three books, two sets of clothes. I counted my money at least three times. I had $25.47. But what I had lots of attitude, I will never give up. It, no matter how tough it is, I know tomorrow is going to be a better day. Passion. Whatever I do, I give it 125%. And then work ethic, I work harder than anybody, <clears throat> and even still today at 84, I still get up at 5.30, I always make my bed, and I always think I'm late. And I love every day, because how can you not? I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And so mm -hmm. then a couple of things happened. I already became successful, and the things, it took me about a year, and I couldn't speak the language. I became a superintendent of one of the larger mills here. Learned the language. Within 10 years, I had my own company, the Brink Group of Companies. Now, we, and it's not about how successful John is, but just for understanding where things want from starting from nothing, is within 10 years, we have 10 companies. And, and so, but even at the time that it was... I already was here for 32 years. Everybody said, oh my God, you're so successful. I didn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. Until I went to the store and I picked up a book that changed my life. And I have the book here, the same that I picked up. January 1997. And the book's title is Driven to Distraction. And it was written by Dr. Halliwell. Mm. And it was about ADHD. And I said, oh my God, that's me. And I wrote in the book, this book actually, and it's still here. I wrote in the book in Dutch. Now I finally know who I am. January 1997. And the more I read the book, the more I started to understand it that 
a couple of things. I knew, I became known that the frequency of occurrence much higher than most people had thought it was. And the other part was that I believe it's a superpower. And so now Dr. Halliwell, medical doctor, ADHD, and uh, as a, also dyslexia, so do I, ADHD and dyslexia, and he has written 18 books, five on distraction, probably one best known around the world for ADHD. And, and so I, uh, you are podcast number 337 for me that I'm hosting. Now, yeah. Dr. Hellywell wrote this book in 1993. I bought it in 1997. I've had it since that time. I had him on my podcast number 203 on the brink with John A. Brink, Dr. Hanleywell. And nice. it changed my life. And so, so what I found during the interview with Dr. Hanleywell, he's the expert, not me, but I lived it, that the frequency of occurrence I said to him in my mind is much higher than I initially thought, about 8 to 10 percent. And I thought maybe 20. He said, no, John, more than 20 percent. I agree with him globally, male and female. And then the other part is because I've been quite successful in business. I'm very involved in board of directors and on and on and on and on. And I know a lot of successful business people and entrepreneurs. I suggested to Dr. Halliwell, in my opinion, 50% of these successful, and the operative is successful, entrepreneurs, business people, are ADHD. 50% of them. He said, no, John, 75%. I agree with him. So that part, after I knew that, I knew now my past. Now, the other challenge that I had, and I explained it to you because we have similarities, in my opinion, I still was struggling with who am I? Who am I? And, and what went wrong where all these other people were so successful and everybody said I was, but I didn't feel that way. And so I was not very good at communications. I was good in a setting close around me. I already had several successful companies. And if I had three or four people together, I was fine. But outside of that, I wasn't. And by pure coincidence, in 1990, I had a friend, ex-sister-in-law actually, that said to me, John, go with me. I'm going to an organization that would be good for you. I said, what is it? She said, Toastmasters. I said, mm. okay, what do, what do they do? Say, communications. I, I, I said, okay, is somebody going to ask me questions? He said, no. You just sit there and watch them and see what they do. And maybe you like it. So then halfway through the meeting, somebody said, Hey, John, tell us all about you. I said, oh, I'll never go back here. <laughs> but I did for 10 years. And I don't know how familiar I are with Toastmasters, but there probably are 450,000 clubs around North America, several in Europe. There's probably four clubs here in my 80,000 family. New York, you probably have 100 clubs. And, and so... What do they specialize in? I stayed there for 10 years, and I went to the highest level in Toastmasters, which is a distinguished Toastmaster. And so, it changed everything that I did from that point forward. What, what is the main thing they do? They make you better listeners. Second one, 
speaking on your feet on topics impromptu. So it organizes your mind to give articulate responses to questions or interaction. And then the other one prepares speaking and evaluate others that do. So the combination of all of it uh, served me very well. And between the war years, still, I'm still affected by PTSD, the end of child, even still now. Mm. And then meeting the Canadian soldiers that gave me the dream to go to Canada. The next one for me at 23 doing what you did is saying, I, I'm working in the forest industry, I'm doing the thing, but I'm, I'm not contented. I know I can do as much as the other ones. But in Holland, the way it works is that as you go, at some point get married, get a job, or go in business, the first question is, okay, we like what you do and blah, blah, blah. Where are your diplomas? I don't have any diplomas. So I felt I had to start anew, totally anew, and start with nothing to prove to me that I can do it. And hence, my dream of going to Canada came through, start with nothing. Then to build a lumber mill, I did, and several other ones, and other companies, and all of that. And then going to Toastmasters for 10 years made me, and I can say that to you, taking it in context, I'm a very good communicator. Even although this is not my native language, and even when I was in Holland, I grew up speaking dialect. So when I went into the army, I, had to, I loved speaking dialect. I had to learn to speak high Dutch I barely got that under control. Then I came here, I had to learn to speak English. So, but I'm doing well. So the, and, and then, obviously, in, uh, you know, the, in 1990, when I went to Toastmasters, I, the first meeting that I went to, and several there after, I've seen hundreds of new candidates that had anxiety or feared speaking in public but I've never seen anybody that had as much anxiety as me. I could have crawled out of there several, several times, but I didn't, and it changed my life. So between that, ADHD, and then the other part that changed my life in 2008, I had a case of diverticulitis that, I don't know if you're familiar with what it is, but I always say to the people that are watching, if you have pain on your right side, I said, potentially appendix. I'm not a dog. If it is on the left side, it's potentially diverticulitis, which is your colon. And, uh, and usually it gets fixed with diet issues. But in my case, it ruptured. And the toxins then start attacking the other organs and you have a limited amount of time until it is too late. So I came that close. So that changed me as well. And what I had been doing up to that point, my wife, she's a vegetarian. I didn't listen as well to us as I should and could have. And I started to change. I was not bad, but I became better at diet. And then... The other part that I did, which so many of us do, and you can relate to this as well, at the end of year we do, I'm going to do this at, uh, next year, this, that, that, and I'm buying a gym membership. And then two weeks later, <laughs> I can give you a hundred reasons why I'm too busy to go there. And so mm. that kind of is what happened. And then after I did that and I got a trainer, after about five or six years, and by then, I'm already approaching 70, you know. So somebody said one day, hey, John, have you ever thought about competing? I said, me? Yeah, 
And so I started competing then. It gives me that challenge. And started competing bodybuilding, physique, Northern Beach, Columbia, then the province, then nationally, and then the Arnold's. And that's where I'm going when at the end of this podcast, uh, you know, so that kind of is my background, but the combination, purely because of circumstance, coming from education, which is so important, that part already put me as different from most to get past that. I had to leave and start over a new and start with nothing. I was going to come back successful or in a box. So today, after 60, I, some people had said to me already for several times that you should write a book about your life so interesting. And, and there's nothing more difficult than writing books. And so about five, six years ago, already well into my 70s, I started to write a book. It took me 80 years to live it. 20 years to think about it, two years to write it against all odds. And, uh, you know, so, and then when I wrote that one, and the more I found out about ADHD and the stigma around it and how many people really, I believe close to 30% of the population around the world, around the world, male and female, different from each other, but are affected by ADHD or slow learning. I felt I had to write a book about that, ADHD Unlocked. And then the other book you have seen, and then the other one that I felt strong about is that I love what I'm doing, and what you're doing is so critically important in your life. I wrote this book, Finding Your Passion, Living the Dream. And so, and the last one that I'm writing is, that's coming out in June, is about communications. The most important part of one's life is to become a good communicator and an effective communicator. But in order to do that, you have to be at peace with who you are. And you have to find out who am I? And then what I say now to young people in particular, if you get too preoccupied, this is not right, that's not right, this is not right, Always remember that there's only one of you on this whole earth that is only one of you that is you and become at peace with who you are and, and uh, then everything is possible. And but for me, as for you, attitude, passion, work ethic, but will follow is success. Good. You have a very... Well, I'll say this. My dad's a huge fan of World War II, so I'm sure he would love to talk to you. Not that he is like a fan of it, but he's a big history buff, so he studies right. everything about tanks and all that. You guys would have a great convo, but I do love your story. You have a very, very unique experience that, um, you know, most people at your age feel that they're too old to do anything. So I very much admire that you don't believe that because no. I also live my life that way. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm only 33, but... I imagine same thing when I'm your age, I'll probably be running a marathon, doing a Spartan, something like I, I don't think I'm ever going to quit because it's a mindset. So I love that you embody it. And the, and the key is healthy living, right? So I was lucky yeah. that I, uh, I got a shock in my life uh, diverticulitis nearly killed me, but it got me thinking seriously about fitness and so, and, and diet. And so for me, there's nothing complicated about it. You must get sunshine, vitamin D. You must get uh, sleep is very, very important. Then healthy food and then keeping your body active. And then your mindset, very critical. And you and me talked about a lot of same experiences, including breast cancer or breast uh, uh, operations, looking for, in my case, uh, 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 hormonal or something that changed in way my life. And, and then uh, other similarities in terms of anxiety and feeling not being good enough compared to others, but then at some point saying, 
I need to start a new in a new direction and I will succeed, you know. Yeah, I think the the coolest thing about life is that nobody has to stay stuck in their circumstance. If you're not happy with your life, it really the problem is it really is as simple as just changing it. But I've come to find that as simple as it is to do the things that will change your life, it's equally as easy to do the things that won't change your life. Like if you feel like you're fat, but you sit there and watch Netflix and eat cheeseburgers, it's as simple as stop eating cheeseburgers and go to the gym, stop watching Netflix. But that's also an easy thing not to do because you're already on the couch eating the cheeseburger, watching the TV show. So it's one of the things that transformed my life was if you do today what others won't, tomorrow you'll have what others don't. And exactly. I try to keep that in mind. Every time I, I look at what I'm about to do, is it going to be easy or hard? And then the question is, is it going to pour into my life now or later? And, and it's really about choosing like that delayed result. Vincent, we both have a deadline to meet here. We nearly 52 minutes. It won't buy very, very quickly for me. I hope you had the same experience. And we should stay in touch. I'm going to mention yes. to Scott, I will send you copies of my book. And, and awesome. uh, yeah, and so, and then at some point, four, five, six months from now, we should kind of do another podcast because we ran out of time and we got so many more things to talk about it. And it's going to be a good one. Yeah, let's do it, man. We'll have a whole little mini series between you and I. We can do it. <laughs> Vincent. Thank you very much for being on my podcast. Thank you for having me, John. Take care.